sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. <laughs> Welcome to a Toxic Mucit version of so Security disgusting. Guy Radio with Chuck. I spent the night in a finished lap, Harold, and Paul. Clear as a bell. Pisto. No, met obst. You should have said. Obst. I met don't obst. even know what it means. It means with cheese. Why would I be with cheese? <laughs> it's the only <laughs> finish I know is with met obst. You and, go, and, and it's Swedish. But, <laughs> oh, know, well, I got to see. I started, why, that's why I, I wouldn't use it. I started an international <laughs> incident here on Security Guy Radio. Swede. I got get it. Well, it's the only thing I know. It's all Scandinavian. It all sounds very similar. What's going on? Anything new? Oh, just the as is conference. As is a tap. Very busy. Yeah, very busy. it was. Yeah, yeah. We did yeah, about twenty. I did about twenty interviews. Yeah, and I'm putting them together in splice, and we'll play them on on the show um, tape. But it came out pretty good. Use the old GoPro, which we're doing today to check on. Yeah, so I saw well. everybody running from you as you was walking through the uh, That's right. conference. I was about to be arrested <laughs> oh and removed. <laughs> Not another interview. Yeah, we actually had uh, quite a few. Uh, I think we got quite a few applications for ATAP as well. Um, you know, while we were there. What's we uh, what's booth. your number right now? Uh, God, sorry, do you, do you know what it is? I think it's about uh, twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. That's good. Something. Yeah, LA is obviously the leading chapter with all know, our nuts and, and fruits uh, and stuff yeah, out here. Yeah. yeah. Not about fruits. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny uh, you happen to mention ATAP. Just as another coincidence, yeah. we always happen to have a guest on any topic you happen to mention. I oh, know. And today it's Mr. Suddenly uh, up here, uh, T- <laughs> Tati Carpella of yes. of um, Peace of Mind HK. I was going to jump in there. Peace of Mind HK. No, Monday. you know, <clears throat> welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Now, yes, good morning, because it's five a.m. over there in, yes. in Finland. Uh, I, when I met him at ATAP, I looked up, right? Because well, I'm you six. Imagine what I'll do. I'm four oh, foot you, nothing. Yeah, I'm I'm six foot <laughs> one, right? And and I thought, oh my god, this guy, he just has to show up, and everybody's going to say behave, yeah. right? But then I saw your first name, and I thought, that doesn't. That, I'm thinking like a Dolph name or some kind of you know, unless unless Tati means like, uh, you know, giant Finnish warrior or something uh, as a name. I didn't think I wasn't sure, but uh, you just had a pretty interesting physical presence. I mean, uh, you have a command presence, a command bearing, and I knew you were a cop just by looking at you. Am I correct? Yes, with the yes, British police, yes, right? So I thought we'd have one to talk about threat assessment in Europe, right? Asia, uh, in in Finland, and uh, his career is really, really interesting. Uh, worked in the military, uh, civilian law enforcement, as a consultant in the corporate world, heavily involved in uh, various. Violent Crime Pre- uh, Prevention Projects and Threat Management, the founder of the Threat Management Service for Helsinki Police Department. Now, that's really interesting. Uh, that must have been pretty difficult to get going um, because it was just a different, probably a new way for them to do business over there, right? I, I, I would assume that the, um, you, you face pretty much the same problems and um, attitudes and... and uh, uh, biases all, all over the world but yes it uh, it did require a lot of work and a lot of uh, changing of the minds so it said also here you worked under the national police and a group of specialists under the Finnish Ministry of Interior that deals with threats against law enforcement and judicial officers and worked uh, for the European Council and other international uh, groups as a subject matter expert so we're really very uh, very happy to have you here and let's talk about threat assessment and how that differs from what we do over here in America, because Paul always talks about the British law enforcement aspects and things, and it, it, it is different. Um, well, one, it's different in the States, depending on where you are as well. It's different in the States. And one thing I, I constantly hear from people overseas is that we have a cowboy mentality. over here. Law enforcement are cowboys in the United yeah. States, right, compared to other places. <laughs> so what do you think about that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Toddy? What's, what are the differences between you know the threat assessment view of threat assessment in America and in Europe and Asia? Well, what's the what's the well? Let's step back a bit. What's the, what's the difference between law enforcement and Finland uh, compared with the states in general? Uh, well, well, I'd, I'd say there's um, 
two differences. Uh, my, my first contact with uh, U.S. law enforcement was in 1989. Um, so there's two differences from my perspective. Um, uh, yes, there is a difference uh, in the, the mindset of the law enforcement. I mean, in both countries you do enforce the laws, but uh, I'd say the Finnish law enforcement uh, mentality is more on the civil servant side of how, how to see yourself as, as part of the, the, the society and, and part of the uh, public, uh, as you might say. That makes sense. Um, but um, there's quite interesting change in um, how law enforcement um, is, um, is looking at um, other organizations. In, in Finland, like in most European countries, the law enforcement is is uh, it's a national police force or it's a federal police force, like in fin uh, like in, in in Finland and all over Scandinavia, and um, it's it's um, at the same time when we're very civil uh, service oriented, uh, we're also a very closed society, and ever since 1989. Um, most of the law enforcement organizations in the U.S., it could be uh, city, county, um, state, federal, uh, are extremely open um, in, in regarding how to share information, which really doesn't happen as, as easily in, in Europe. So American law enforcement uh, has been extremely um, hospitable. Um, and and very very open in sharing information, which is something I think a lot of the European organizations might uh, learn from. Now, on a, on, is this on a federal level or dealing with you know you and LAPD sheriff folk, or are you talking about you and the FBI? I, 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 with, well, with, for example, with Marion County Sheriff's Department or with LAPD or with the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigations, where wherever I've gone to, um, American law enforcement is is much more um, proactive uh, you know, towards uh, um, sharing information and, and cooperating. No, that's right. Interesting. Now, here's my experience with, uh, believe it or not, I happen to have a Finnish law enforcement story. Oh, go on. Just happen to have that. Go on. And so okay. I was trying to spend the night in a Finnish lap. Drum roll, please. Does everybody understand that joke? Anyway, uh, so I'm driving down the fjords there, and I, with my with my buddy in my little Citroen, French frog, flat car and he's got his little camera out and he's, and he's taking pictures and I look over there and I see some word that I recognize roughly as don't do that like verboten forbidden stop what are you doing and I said I don't think we're supposed to take pictures he's, ah, the, the, forget about it there's nobody here and this is really an isolated area right and within about five minutes of doing this <laughs> we were surrounded by about three cars and guys with machine guns that pulled us over and got us out of the car with the machine guns by the way very polite even though they're machine guns right and uh, I guess we were filming on a military base of some kind, right? But even though they were pointing machine guns at us, I will say it wasn't the same. Um, I don't know. As aggressive or? I was scared to polite? death because I thought these guys would just kill me and go get a cup of coffee, <laughs> right? <laughs> Instead of, you yeah. know, where you see SWAT and all our Americans are like, you know, cowboys. Let's all go, boys. Come on, take that hill. And I don't know, just a different approach yeah, to it, right? Yeah. Um, so I understand what you're saying because it is more of a. Civil servant's job, I, I, that's the best way to describe it. Yeah. You do, and we, we had a comment about this from uh, my, our British friend in Florida when I did the interview, right? Mm -hmm. They incorporate safety into the into the neighborhoods, right? So there, there's security, right? But it's really about the safety of the people. And it's the British law enforcement model is about the safety of the people. And Americans, I think, are more about protective, right? It's like a hard, a hard to protect the target uh, and to be defensive. It's a little different. Is it more of a, over there, is it more of a local law enforcement you know, sort of by the beat type of thing, as it is in some of the cities in the UK. Well, it used to be that way, but um, uh, Finland has the least amount of law enforcement officers in the whole of Europe. Really, how interesting! So, so you really don't see any police officers, yeah. and, and you only see them when when you call the emergency number. So, but it, it, it yeah, Paul, it, it used to be that way. Yeah, so it's it's reducing it in the UK now. Well, it's well, kind well, of all so over the world. It's kind of going yeah. down. Now, is that? You did mention they were federal police, so to speak. Uh, I mean, there isn't a uh, Helsinki PD, local uh, PD. It's still there's. They may work locally there, but it's still federal jurisdiction. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. We're, we're all, uh, no matter where you see the police, it could be Highway Patrol or Helsinki PD or uh, National Bureau of Investigations. They're all the same police organization. Now, what do you think about that? Because you've worked over here now and seen our model. I had, the, well, Greg, we had on the show and a guy before that, um, we were talking about this, and the feds are coming in saying, you guys don't know how to do law enforcement anymore. So we're going to come in, and we're going to take over and federalize that police department. You're going to follow federal rules. It's just it's just not an American thing because the states are so separate from each other. Mm. And my concern is if the feds come up with standards because of all our different states and all our different cultures and all our different you know approaches to things, it, one size might not fit all here. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it, I, I wouldn't compare uh, – countries you got what 400 million people in uh in uh, the u.s and, and, we they're, got and they're all in los angeles at the moment <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so so um i mean clearly it makes it much easier because all the police training is is the same um with seven thousand officers which is the national police of finland wait wait, wait. pretty seven, much know most of the uh, most of the officers You've seven thousand officers for the whole country yeah that's less than LAPD has. Oh yeah, yeah I'm moving like, to Finland. Saying so. I'm moving to <laughs> Finland. I'm going there. But well, LA could do with with a with a reduction of the number of police departments. I mean, how, how many police departments? Oh, there's in, in LA, LA County has ridiculous. fifty, and Orange County has about fifty. It's yeah, crazy. It's small. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, the jurisdictional stuff. It, it, it should be one the police department. That's interesting. You, you mentioned that the crime is so low over there, right? So when I was a boy and went over there after high school. Um, Every, the country was just depressed. Everything was down. It was, and I said, you know, what, what's going on? I'm trying to read the newspapers. And I guess like a, a small boy, you know, 10 years old, 8 years old, had been kidnapped and murdered. And the country was just, the whole country was involved in this. And I kept going, what's the, I mean, it's sad, right? But I, and that stuff doesn't, at the time, that stuff didn't happen over there. It was just a different culture, completely yeah. different culture. Dust were desensitized from it, you know. So they may be honest with them. It's very interesting. All right. So I guess we don't have a show because there's no threats in Finland, <laughs> yeah, <that was> easy. <laughs> easy. I'm just teasing. So you work in the in the, you work out of Hong Kong, right? That's one field you work in. Yes. And tell us what you do over there. Well, um, we we started a company in Hong Kong five and a half years ago, um, simply because we needed new, needed new markets. Um, Finland being so very very small, and uh, um, we mainly work with global companies that have global workplace violence policies, uh, but the lack of knowledge uh, regarding threat assessment and threat management is tremendous in Asia. Uh, with, with over 4 billion people living in Asia, apparently 4 billion people cannot live together in peace. So um, we have big global companies that are using our services that they would normally do themselves in, in North America or in Europe. Oh, that's but interesting. What, what we're, are their, we're the local, local experts. What are their big concerns over there? What, what are they worried about the most? Well, I, I, I'd say pretty much the same type of violent crime that we have uh, in, in the West. So, so you do have uh, uh, workplace violence uh, incidents between customers and, and staff. You got domestic violence spillovers. You got ex-employees who are sending threats. You have uh, psychotic people that are, are thinking whatever they are thinking. And so it's it's very broad and and very much the same type of threats that you would have. Uh, the solutions are very different, though. No, oh, let's talk about that. Why are they Why are they different? Well, first of all, uh, there's very few laws that you could use in in, in a situation. Um, I, I was just uh, for for ATAP. I did a study of uh, 35 um, Asian countries, and most of the Asian countries don't have restraining orders. They don't have stalking laws. Oh. Um, they might not have a domestic violence laws as as how we would see them. And, and if you do have the laws, then local law enforcement or the courts are very reluctant to respond. So, so what you would typically use as one of the tools to, to solve the problem or manage the problem is not there. And the other issue is, is the, the general mindset uh, regards uh, mental health and the lack of mental health professionals which is a fact in almost all over Asia. 
How do you how do you help your clients then uh, navigate all that stuff? If there's no laws, is this handled on a civil level, not a criminal level? Is it handled in a lawsuit manner? Is it handled with uh, you know payola? You know, pay the guy off to stop bothering me. Well, how does that work then? That's very interesting. I didn't realize there's a lack of lack of those kind of laws over yeah, there. Yeah, I could see that. Interesting. Yeah. Well, well, well. You do have to use your imagination, but uh, one one way, um, unfortunately, is simply to to pay off the person. If 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 it's more on the criminal harassment case uh, instead of uh, problems with mental health, um, you might end up using local religious uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, you might go to imam, remembering that. Over half of the world's um, uh, Muslims are living in Asia. That's right. People forget that, right? Yeah. So, so you might want to go and and talk to the local religious leader or a priest to see if if there's any connection. I mean, um, if 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 this person does um, have the the typical mindset that you would see with therapists, you might want to use them, or or the role of family. Family is very very important compared to most of the western countries that that I've worked in so so family does have an influence um, the problem is if if it's clearly a mental health problem then they they might not have um, the means or the willingness to to truly face the problem like like in China uh, we've had incidents where the family has built a cage uh, to their home with the help of the local police, um, just to just to incarcerate the person who has mental health issues. Really, wow! That really doesn't help you, man. So now, are you going to describe the? It sounds like you're describing lawlessness, but not really. This is strictly a culture. This is just how they handle things, and, and you know we're we're extra heavy on laws, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. compared to England, or even worse, we have more laws than anybody. So our solution is laws. Their solution is. Cultural, it sounds like. They handle things. Now, are they, do they not have the laws because, I don't know, they can't Google ATAP and figure out that they need one? Or is it, ju is it just a, strictly a cultural thing? Or, or the lack of laws, does that help solve other problems they have? Well, you've got to remember how long it took to get our sort of laws going over here from a stalking perspective. I mean, it, well, that's, know, really I can see that as being more complicated. Yeah. Five years ago. Yeah. You but, know. I mean, I'm surprised they wouldn't have any way besides you know, locking a guy up in his house to handle mental illness is kind of interesting. So your effectiveness is about relationships. You, you have to have the relationships and be able to, to navigate that through through persuasion instead of coercion, really. I mean, that's the way we look at it, yeah. Absolutely. So, so, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. How do you, how do, you deal with, um, I mean, you've got these different companies. I mean, how are you received by human resources and, and those sort of, and who, who normally brings you in to a, you know, to a large company over there in Saudi well, Arabia. It's, it's, it's either HR or it's the security department. Uh, but um, uh, for example, in China, um, sometimes the main problem is with HR, uh, especially if you have a local head of HR. Um, we've had quite polarized situations uh, with some of the um, client companies where the head of HR is, is what I would call old school. So um, they, they see middle class as class with no rights. And um, the attitude is, is very black and white, which clearly creates a lot of problems within the organization. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it is the HR that, that prefers to use us. Um, otherwise, it's the head of security uh, who who has a problem and uh, needs help from the headquarters. But headquarters hopefully has our contact information, so it's easier for us to fly in from Hong Kong or from Malaysia or from Singapore to to deal with the problem. Now, why are you considered the subject matter expert? Uh, being outside the culture, I find that interesting. It seems like their internal security force just doesn't deal with this thing. They just haven't caught up with this sort of... Uh, Technology is not the right mindset yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I I would say that the um, the the difference in in mindset when when we would have at least half of the Asian countries looking at prevention of targeted violence the way that we we look in the West um, we're we're twenty thirty years behind. 
So that, wait, wait, that, who, who's that 30 gap years? is amazing. Who's 30 years behind? Asia? Asia, oh. yeah. How do they handle yeah. something differently than us? Give me an example. How do they handle differently? Yeah. Well, they don't handle it. That, that, that <laughs> there is you the go. Issue. It's, it's the issue of denial. Yeah. Looking the other way. We've, we've been involved in, in um, terrorist threats. And I'm not talking about terrorism, but, but threats to kill. Right. Uh, cases that have been going on for five years. And the only response that the country management or the HR has, has been doing is just looking the other way, hoping that the thing goes away. Wow. Which apparently leads to a huge turnover of staff when, when people don't feel too safe. <laughs> but, but that's the way it used to be handled over here. That I sounds mean, extreme, and, though. You know, I think, I think, you know, when I first got here a long time ago, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's how companies handled it. You know, and, and it was really just the... The formation of of different departments that were, you know, were, were looking at this sort of stuff that 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 brought it to it is now where it is now over here, and it was the Rebecca Schaefer and those sort of well, that's what kind of broke of it issues here. Yeah. That sort of broke it open, you know. Mm-hmm. But I mean, and there's still companies that over here that that don't want to recognise it as going. No, on. a lot of companies yeah. here still don't have workplace violence programs yeah. or policies. Or Surprisingly, like yeah. So, do we have a higher incident of? Uh, Death, death, death of employees in the work workforce over there. I mean, oh, well, Sam, Sam got killed by the guy in Cubicle Three. Well, I don't, with I a know. chopstick. No, just go get get a requisition for a new guy. We need okay. another guy. I mean, I, I'm making fun of it, kind of, but on the other hand, I'm kind of serious. I mean, if they're ignoring things, people must be getting hurt. Things must happen because not everybody can, you know, have the have the the uh, you know the ability to hire you, or mm-hmm. not everybody. And there's not a lot of experts over there about it. So I mean, what happens to people? Do they just become victims and quit or leave or what? Or just yeah. put up with it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'd say the most typical way is, is simply to uh, change jobs. Because, uh, again, in many Asian countries, um, people change jobs um, much more frequent uh, than what they do in the West. Um, if, with a, even with a change of title that, that uh, gives an impression that, that you're successful, um, people change jobs. We we usually don't end up doing any type of trainings uh, right after the Chinese New Year because right after Chinese New Year's you you get your annual bonus, and companies are very often saying that well let's let's wait and see who's still working for us uh, after oh, Chinese New Year. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a guard gets his check on Friday. We don't see him on Monday. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, that's exactly the case. How are you received by the local law enforcement uh, agencies you work with? Um, not well. Oh, that's um, interesting. All right. Very, very, very uh, machismo culture. Um, very um, well. They, on on the on the surface, um, you're usually uh, greeted very warmly and and nicely and politely. But when things would need to actually happen, uh, when they would have to take place, or you would need the police. Um, it rarely happens, Un- unless you know you have your red envelopes, you have your your uh, <clears throat> dinner parties that that you you might you might host. But but that's a very very dangerous. Area. Sounds like an American election. Sounds very similar. <laughs> yes, <yeah. laughs> very similar yeah. kind of thing. Well, I well, mean, unless your name's Trump. Well, it's you know we're we're only <laughs> half kidding, right? Because in the end, uh, it comes down to relationships. Right, good yeah, or bad. I mean, if it's if it's a dicey relationship, if it's an uncomfortable relationship, you still have to have some kind of rapport with the people that you deal with. Absolutely. And, it, and if you got to get them a red envelope to make it work. Now, I assume you're not making a lot of arrests working with law enforcement. What is law enforcement? How do you use law enforcement over there as your tool, so to speak, to help you with these problems? If there's no laws and they can't arrest, is it used more as a, I don't know, an intimidation factor or something, or or what? Yeah, yeah, basically intimidation, and. Um, well, th- there is one good side. Uh, usually, when when law enforcement responds, if they make an arrest, um, the um, justice system, uh, once the justice system gets going, um, uh, the punishments that that you you might get are very very harsh. Mm. They're they're very severe. The problem is if it's a big multinational company that is asking assistance from law enforcement. Um, they might completely see it as a as a victimless crime, even though there is a human being who's a victim. But if you're working right. for a big company, they they might not help you, or or they might see it as a as an internal issue. Uh, with like like we had a case, we had a case where 
uh, an ex-employee kept uh, turning up and, and completely and absolutely fully stalking the, the country manager and the local police in, in China did not respond simply because they say it's it's your own problem, it's your own ex-employee, so you deal with it. And we never got the police to involve. Oh, interesting. It's something I've never really looked into, but what's the uh, what's the ability to, to uh, get firearms and that type of thing over there? I mean, are they on the streets or... Um, is it hard to get? Weapons? Oh, for for him if he's traveling, you mean? Well, no, for for oh bad you know, guys, yeah, for bad guys. Yeah. You know, if you had a violence in well, a workplace, well, it, it, it depends on the country. Um, uh, it really, I mean, in in for example, in the Philippines, everybody's packing. It, every single person, it's it's completely legal to have a firearm, uh, unless it's the election time uh, when when <laughs> it's probably, against the law. That's probably a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> and it's quite funny in in, in the Philippines. It's um, I, I believe it's six months before the um, uh, elections. Uh, there's a, a national ban to carry firearms, and what you see in the Philippines is robberies and homicides uh, going up because criminals are are aware that, that oh, yeah. uh, honest citizens are not packing. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, but uh, uh, just uh, less than a month ago, we had uh, the police in China and Hong Kong arresting. Um, uh, triad members, and uh, they arrested fifty-five thousand triad members. Wow. Oh God, that's a big jail. Where the hell would you put them? <laughs> well, it's yeah. China. Uh, it's and nice. um, and the amount of firearms was was ridiculously small. So you you really don't see. I mean, you see meat cleavers and, yeah. and you see knives and swords, but uh, not not too many firearms in in China at least or in Hong Kong. Well, it, it is. It, it, Guns are neater, if you think about it. I don't want to get cleaved yeah, and chopped. No, that's it's, right. it's very brutal. Oh, right? actually, it's very I personal. When I was a cop, we were in, uh, uh, doing a beat in, in London. I mean, you never went to some, where somebody ran out of a Chinese restaurant. I mean, you knew somebody was going to get hurt, you know, from yeah. the from the, from the the people from the restaurant because they would come out and they'd literally chop them up. I well, mean, it was vicious stuff. All right, so here's so here, here's what i got to grasp. If, if we have stalkers here, we think they're going to – Probably shoot you, attack you, you know. And if there's not a lot of guns over there, what are people afraid of? Is it I'm going to beat you up? I'm going to hit you with a baseball bat? I mean, do you have a, do you have a high death rate? Not high, but do you have a death rate associated with the types of stalking and, and things you have over there that's different than over here? You know, because most stalkers over here don't kill you; they just really annoy the heck out of you. But you know, well, well, the the problem is uh, since stalking is is not. Um, in 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 the law, so there is no statistic on on stalking crimes. No, that's true. So it's difficult to say. That was a but, bad but security guy. Usually, pressure. the preferred yeah. tool of the trade is is <laughs> some type of edged weapon. Knives. They like knives. Knives. Yeah. So is there a? Uh, I mean, is there a lot of internet stalking over there, or or is that really just a Western problem where somebody's stalking somebody over the internet? I mean, we're seeing it a lot in the states, but. Well, well, that's 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 an interesting question. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, when it is stalking uh, online in social media, uh, we rarely deal with these cases because it's it's more it's not a corporate kind of uh, uh, a problem as as much as it yeah, would be okay. interpersonal. Well, see, I don't get that part because here, if you're ABC Corporation, you mm-hmm. probably have an electronic use policy. You probably have electronic stocking policy if you're anybody yeah. right that's big why don't they just take the laws not laws per se it's a bad choice of words why don't they take the policies and procedures they use over here to make their workplace effective and why don't they oh, that's true. implement them over there yeah. right because yeah. they, they have the just blueprint yeah. over here and maybe i can't arrest you in china but i can fire you are you mm. finding that there's that the employee discipline does not go uh, hand in hand with uh, the ability to to cite a law. So if well, there's no law, I can't fire the guy. I mean, I don't know. How do they handle that? Well, well, uh, amazingly so. You would imagine that uh, uh, firing people in Asia um, would be easy, but uh, in in many many countries, uh, workers are extremely protected. Huh. So so it's it's not as easy as one would think uh, to get rid of somebody, even if you're the perpetrator. Mm. And if there's Even, not a law, then there's not a corporate policy probably for it. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I know when I was doing a lot of work down in Mexico, really hard to get rid of somebody. I mean, huh. and you wouldn't believe that. You know, you, right. you think that Mexico is a sort of Wild West type of place, but it's not. 
So we had a guy on our show, Doc Rogers, remember, one of our first yeah. guests? And Doc, I know you're watching, so <laughs> don't don't be offended, but he writes some books on Asia protection, and he's been around a long time, and he, and he sent me a bunch of notices and said, here's what we're going to talk about. And I'm thinking, this is like our second show, and we're all excited. We're reading all these things. Going, this is great. And we said, Doc, what's the number one threat to executives at Asia? And he says, traffic, Chuck. And then he stops talking. <laughs> and the whole show. It was very interesting. It was very interesting. <laughs> So let's talk about executive protection. Let's shift over to executive protection, right? So is Doc correct? I mean, it, listen, there's a billion cars over there. Somebody falls off a bicycle and 10 people are injured. Congestion, uh, you know, is that is that something you look at for executive protection beyond the, the typical threats, you know? Because he, he said traffic is a huge problem. A lot of people get hurt and killed in traffic accidents over there. Uh, absolutely. Tra- traffic is, is, uh, is definitely the number one killer. Um, no matter what position you're in in, in the organization. So uh, uh, traffic is horrible um, un- unless you're, you're in uh, Singapore or, or uh, in, in Hong Kong. So do you, do you pl- play in that space? Do you provide transportation for people and, and all kinds of stuff? More from a safety point of view than an executive protection point of view? No, no, we we don't do any any type of physical protection. We we simply recommend companies that we know are trustworthy. But um, that's 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 not our business. Oh, so no bodyguard work? No. So oh, okay. we, well, so when it, when it comes to assessment of of threats or or um, event uh, management, yes, that that's what we do. But uh, we we have. No, no physical security services, uh, and it's also it makes it a whole lot easier in, in many Asian countries to operate when when you are not doing what what they would call as typical security job. Oh, and you're not you're not treading on the locals, uh, the the locals, uh, the local jobs, uh, local and jobs licensing, and making and money, stuff. and all the rest of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you just go out and find. What do they do? Um, uh, and I know different countries are, you know, obviously different. But what about background checks and all that sort of stuff on employees? I mean, and how do you do background checks? If you know, I mean, over here, a, a big thing of a you know a threat assessment is is to look at somebody's background, criminal, civil. I mean, all the rest of the good stuff. But how do you, can you do that over there? Is there a way of doing it? Well, well, in, in in some countries it's it is very easy and it's very open, and and in other countries in Asia, um, there there is very little information you can get simply because there are no national records, uh, or there is um, many ways to write your name, or the mm-hmm. organizations are not keeping a record uh, because you're low level employees, so they're not interested in in keeping tracks on you. Um, but we do have a few companies that we use uh, that have the necessary connections with with uh, law enforcement and other organizations. Do you do you evaluate a threat in a workplace over there differently than you would evaluate it here or in in uh, Finland? Is there a different approach well, to it? Well, well, well. Uh, let's 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 say uh, the the basis of of violent behavior um, is not culturally. Um, uh, dictate that it doesn't change. I mean, you you have the same danger signs and and same symptoms uh, with with the, with the groundwork of of violent crime. Um, but um, of course, you do have to take into consideration uh, again the role of the family and the role of uh, losing one's face or gaining one's face, um, and um, also the the. Um, the difference with Western culture being very, very self-centered, uh, being it's all about me and it's all about uh, me, myself, and I. And whereas in Asia, it's it's clearly it's it's completely different, related to your perspective on yourself. You are part of a family, or you are part of a village, or you are part of the society. So, so that would be a, a major issue that also changes your assessment. Now, that's interesting. So, um, do they not perceive some things as threats that you perceive as a threat? In other words, if I'm part of this group and somebody's bothering me, um, well, that's just my role. I have to accept that. Where here, <laughs> everybody's indignant and offended by the littlest thing. You know, Americans just going crazy now with all this. I'm offended by this and I'm offended by that. 
Uh, mm. polit- you talk about politically correctness. Well, or, political correctness, just, but well, just even beyond political correctness. I mean, you know, people are. I'm offended by that. Well, so what? I could care less if you're offended. I have a right to <laughs> to avenge you, right? But people now it flips the other way. So if you're, I, that's a very interesting perspective you have on the on the the cultures. Mm. Uh, do you you know make a recommendation and say, hey, I think you're in danger? And they say, oh no, that's my brother-in-law. Well, yeah, but he's got a machete. And he said he wants to kill you. Yeah, but he's my brother-in-law. He's not going to kill me. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's, there's there's a different perception of what a danger is, maybe in, the, in culturally, than there is over here. Yeah, um, absolutely, but but it also combines the uh, culture of denial. It's 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 not just looking at things differently and seeing yourself as as part of the bigger picture, um, but it's it's definitely also um, the the mindset of well, I'm not going to think about it, so it's not going to be dangerous to me. Huh. Um, so so the reporting level for uh, behavior that would cause concern is definitely different in Asia than in Western countries. Now, if you've got somebody who's from Asia, um, how can we change the way that we approach uh, threat, threat assessment, threat management I mean, here, over here, if you're evaluating somebody here, yeah. with somebody's, you know, somebody's from Asia. I That's mean, an excellent should, question, should, Paul Bristow. Oh, Once be, in a while, you say. get a zinger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good. <laughs> but how, how do we, you know, over here take take your lessons that you've learned? I mean, what what can you sort of impart to us to, uh, to you know, to look at this stuff differently where we're dealing with somebody from Asia? So, so are you talking uh, a situation where the victim or or the perpetrator is is from Asia? Well, both. Maybe I both. Because yeah. presumably you got different interactions, right? Uh, well, I mean, when I when I was working at San Gabriel PD back in the eighties, uh, there was a, a, a big influx of, uh, I think I think it was Vietnamese, you know, in, coming yeah. into the culture, and I made the mistake one day of uh, doing what we do with other people that we thought were a threat. There were some gangs there, and I said, I need you to sit down on the curb. You know, put your legs in front of you and cross your legs. Just a safety. T- the guy flipped out, went wacky, right? And then we had some training and said, you know, you don't do that because if the police put you on the curb and make you sit down, they're going to execute you maybe in some <laughs> cultures. And I, you know, I learned a big lesson on that one, right? So it is a good question because you may think they're, uh, like like Toddy said, maybe they're they're denying it. You may think they're just being uncooperative, but they may not be uncooperative. Yeah. They just might think there's no problem, right? Mm-hmm. And that person here inside a corporate environment, maybe causing danger to everybody else around them and not even be aware of it. It's like, oh, it's my brother-in-law. He said he wants to kill me. Well, it's not a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. Uh, and from a subject's point of view, I mean, we, we, you know, we do tend to, I know, you know, everybody says, well, every case is individual, you know, but as you know, in the threat management field, you tend to look at uh, groups of uh, cases that tend to work the same way. So you've, you've, you've sort of, you sort of build this expectation that a case is going to go in a certain direction, right. trying to bear in mind that it may not. But what's the difference between the directions that the you know a typical case in the states would take and and one from Asia? You know, I mean, over it. I mean, you deal with cases uh, that have got a certain you know you can basically calendar contact. You know, if somebody's been doing something for the same for the last six months. You can basically assume He's gonna that keep they're going to be doing usually. the same. Yeah. I mean, is that the same in Asia? You know, or do they go all over the place? Well, I, I'd say the the first thing um, with working with victims and working uh, with organizations that have uh, employees in Asia, local employees, would be to uh, emphasize the uh, duty to report behavior and not from the victim's mm-hmm. perspective, but say uh, it is corporation's concern or it is your duty towards the corporation uh, to report problematic behavior and then just clearly list what is problematic behavior. So so in, instead of having the emphasis on the single employee, the uh, internal policy uh, should emphasize that uh, is it's your part of the uh, organization to report problematic behavior. So, so the focus should not be on on a single I- individual, but rather on on the corporation or the society that that the corporation is is creating. For example, a factory with seven thousand people is is clearly a society um, in itself. 
so so that that would uh, need to be different in, in many many countries and and with many organizations now uh, related to suspects uh, behavior um, I when we do our threat assessment we are using the same tools that we're using in Europe as well um, and and the tools that are very well known in the Western threat assessment uh, and threat management society and they seem to work well enough um, I, I haven't seen a specific need for an Asian uh, uh, threat assessment tool uh, for us to use. Because as I said, the, the basic foundation of violent behavior, it really doesn't change when it comes to uh, motivation or, or skills or capability to, to hurt another human being. Well, the fact that the, the victim may not see himself as a victim and may say, uh, you know, culturally I belong to this subgroup here and I have to go along with what's going on, doesn't that change the actual behavior of, of the uh, the perpetrator? Doesn't it make him maybe up his game or try to be more aggressive or something like that? Uh, here, if somebody comes after you, you call HR, you call the cops, you call the security guard, and everybody rushes around and tries to do something, and then either gets resolved or it escalates, right? And you seem to, what you're saying is you have cases that go on for a long, long time. Uh, what, you know, what causes that to go on for so long and not be resolved? I understand the law part that, there's not a law to do anything about it, but seems like there should be, if you're using the same tools, there should be other ways to resolve it, right? See what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think of a, a, a good example uh, to share at the moment. But So if you got a stalker out here, the guy stalks, and, and if they're smart, they don't cross the line with the law, right? They come yeah. up to the edge. So you can't prosecute them. So then we go into, like at the stewards. Actually, until they're ready to do something. Until they're ready to do something. Then yeah. we go into the management phase and maintenance, and we just track the guy. We you know, see if he's writing letters every day. That's all fine. That's all fine. And those cases go on for years and years and years. But I, you know, we didn't always feel the sense of danger involved in that because we were watching it and seeing what was going on. But if you have non-cooperation, really non-cooperation of victims and suspects over there, that seems much more difficult to manage. Well, I, I think what you're saying, though, is if is if you can, and I found this very interesting because it's sort of opposite of over here. Um, if you can say to a, a a target that you're part of that company and you need to cooperate with the and, and fall in line with the policies from that company, they do they tend to do that. They do that. Is right. that right? Because yeah. that's yeah. not always the case here. Because everybody's an individual. In the states, a lot more than you know, a lot of other cultures. No, well, you said the point when you said there's seven thousand people in a factory. That's a society, and that's a you know, that's a culture, and that's a whole different thing. Yeah, there are seven thousand people at Fox, but everybody's an individual oh, at Fox, yeah. and everybody's <laughs> going to get their own special treatment, and their own special bodyguards, and yeah. so it is a different way to, to look is, at it. Is the sort of continuum the same? You know, over there, do you do you see that that I mean, you know, we've been saying that basically use the same tools. So that continuum, you know, up to the up to up to violence is basically the same. Yeah, um, uh, uh, pretty much. The the only major difference is is clearly the um, in in many countries is the the lack of firearms. Hmm. But that's that's again just just one tool. To, to commit the violent crime. You can do it with your vehicle, with explosives, with, with machetes, whatever you can get your hands on. Not but, the, uh, otherwise, you do see the, the pathway to violence hmm. uh, escalate very, very much the same way. Would you say, the same way, now, would you say it's, um, uh, not, I don't know what's the word, not similar, but we use guns over here. We like guns. It's a gun-centric hmm. society, okay? Are you, would you suggest that uh, the pathway to violence in, in an Asian market is basically the same, but it's not guns? In other words, there's no less violence. It's just a different type of violence. Is that a good way to look at it? Yeah. But, and again, in, in some countries, you have plenty of, of, of guns. Um, uh, to, to give an example, we, um, at the moment, uh, we're, we're uh, training mid-level management in the... Um, recognition of problematic behavior and and de-escalation skills and this is a, this is a client organization that has a staff of 6000 uh, that that we're dealing with right now and uh, the way we we got the job uh, was um, the head of security for Asia 
uh, gives me a call and says, uh, our, our, our employees, and this is not China, this is Southeast Asia, uh, our, our employees at this uh, particular establishment are, are very hot-blooded. And at the moment, they're trying to sort out their internal problems by bringing uh, machetes and handguns to, uh, handguns to the workplace. <laughs> so, so would you be able to train our managers on, on how to detect the problematic behavior beforehand and de-escalate it? So, um, yeah, so, so their, their way of dealing with internal problems is I'll shoot you or I'll, I'll try to cut you in half. Now, it seems like this is more in the open, this violence. In other words, when the guy shows up at the office and shoots everybody, people mm -hmm. say, well, yeah, I thought he would do that, but I didn't tell anybody about it. It's, you know, well, well, it's unexpected. It, this it, seems like this is part of the normal, yeah. you know, day to day. This, this is a Southeast Asian country where, where um, violence is more, um, as, as you said, it's, it's more open and the society kind of recognizes itself for, for uh, uh, being more hot-blooded. And it's why, why it's taking care of problems. Well, it's a way to solve problems, right. <laughs> they solve problems using that, and, and, yeah. and maybe it's not viewed as violence as much as it's viewed as a way to solve things, right? That's very interesting. So, something I've always been interested in uh, since working in the, you know, in the healthcare industry a lot, um, do you see a lot of bullying in the workplace here? I mean, is that a, is that a problem from a violence perspective? Well, okay. See, that's that's an interesting uh, question. Well, it would be. It's for me. Why do you keep getting interesting questions today? <laughs> Darn you, drat! Um, I, I was I was doing a presentation for the uh, Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce. On, was it was it on, was it Hong Kong or Hong Kong? Uh, is there really a Hong Kong? You have to ask Chuck. That's an inside joke. Right, so I yes. typed wrong. Sorry, I, my part. I but is there a Hong Kong? There's not. I'm sure there's not a Hong Kong. <laughs> So, so I was I was doing a presentation on on the basis of of threat assessment and threat management, and uh, I, I I briefly touched base on uh, uh, personality disorders, and and every once in a while, as as a speaker, you you see that you lose connection with the audience, and and as soon as I touched base with personality disorders, the, the, the connection was lost. So so I had to go back and say it was lost. How many of you have ever heard? Uh, anything related to personality disorders. And it turns out that 90% of the participants never heard of the term or the concept of personality oh. disorders. Huh. So, so I said, well, let's talk about two of the most problematic in the workplace, narcissism and, and borderline. And, and when, when I started to talk about narcissism, uh, that, many people in the audience said, no, 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 that's can, our boss. Can I stop you there real quick? Because we've got listeners yeah. who would not know what those two things were. Oh, yeah. So could we, you explain? we got to dumb it down for our nieces and nephews. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, when, when, you, when you talk about personality disorders, it's, it's uh, uh, currently the estimate is that 14% uh, of the general population um, uh, have some type of personality disorder, and and just to to put it in a very very simple form, it's it's usually an individual with with very simplistic and and uh, I I would say polarized way of dealing with different types of problems, and they use these simple ways um, in every single situation, which often creates problems in in their social life with with their friends if they have any uh or in the workplace because they they are unable to adapt to the environment and they're strongly using a uh fewer or or a simple one set of problem solving skills um in in dealing with it could be avoiding the the problems so so you're talking about avoidance in general or you could be very, very self-centered and everything is evolving around you, or you could be overly dramatic. And, and, and so, so there's cluster A, B, and C, different types of, of disorders. And, and usually we're dealing with uh, narcissism and borderline, which are the most typical ones to create the, the, the concerns in the workplace. Tony, no, so, so get back to your story. Sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah so so I, I was describing typical issues related to narcissism, and and many people in the audience said, "No, no, no, no. That's our boss. That's that's <laughs> we're describing our typical boss." And one one of the definitions is that the personality disorder must create um, uh, problems for you. But in Asian culture, 
if if you're narcissist, if you're self-centered, if if it's all about you, then that's typical behavior that you usually expect from your boss. So it really doesn't create problems. Well, it does create a problem. They just don't realize it, I suppose. They don't recognize it as a problem, right? Yeah. Well, well, it depends. I mean, if everybody <laughs> says that's the way for the boss to behave, no, if, they accept if you it. Do I mean, the yeah. same thing in the U.S. This person would not be a boss for very long in in many companies. Well, I don't know. I've worked for some companies. <laughs> well, if you work in a studio, although you were a very good studio boss, I have to say, you you were you were very you were not a narcissist. No, boss. I wasn't. No. but we worked for a lot. No, we it. did. Yeah, very interesting. So you caught their attention by describing it in this way, but does it help them when you give these lectures? As they do, they start to, if they're not if they're going to accept that as part of the culture, I guess it's not going to help them solve a problem. Well, well, it depends. As as said, if if we have a Western company as a client, uh, the, the problem usually is is that the client does have a global policy, but the country manager or head of HR or head of security just doesn't understand it, or it is a policy that it is impossible to to implement. For example, related to. Uh, when when we had the umbrella revolution in in uh, Hong Kong a year ago, uh, we had a number of American companies uh, calling us and saying, "Can you fix us uh, a armed security and armored uh, limousine for our bank managers in in Hong Kong?" You can't because security is not allowed to carry even a baton when they're working let oh. alone having a firearm. And, and there are no armored vehicles in Hong Kong. Hmm. So, so these might be the problems that, that you have to explain back to the headquarters in the U.S. Hmm. When, uh, typically in, in sort of Asian culture, when they're firing somebody, terminating somebody, I mean, a big thing you know, that we always try and push over here is the respect when you're firing somebody, etc. I mean, is that, right. is that, do you get them accepting that over there or did I just walk you in and you know your history sort of and put the boot to your rear end well again uh, it, it depends so much on the company um, as, as, as I mentioned in the beginning we might sometimes have an HR manager who really doesn't care for for the employees so so it can be extremely unpleasant and humiliating and in some companies they're very good at at saving your face and 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 truly concern uh, over your well-being and and the well-being of your family so it depends on the client how is it go i'm sorry go ahead. No, go ahead. well i was just going to say i mean i would imagine with the culture over there um you know if you was to disrespect somebody as i as i were going out the door that would be even worse than over here wouldn't it absolutely oh yeah yeah so how are you rec- how are you received by not the management you're dealing with, right? Because I'm assuming you can, you know, not consult with, but you deal with the employees sometimes, right? So if I go out and teach a security department about uh, behavior recognition and how to spot the quiet guy who's going to shoot you and all that kind of stuff, the security department's like, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, thanks a lot. And then when you take that same company and move into the employees, the civilian population, very responsive. Wow, thanks for telling us this stuff. We didn't know this stuff goes on. Security never tells us these things, so on and so forth. Are you received well by the general population of employees if you're in there doing a lecture about personality disorders or talking about how to change their culture and recognize violence and stuff? Well, well, in in some companies, um, you 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 feel like uh, you feel like a circus monkey. So so you're just an entertaining big guaylo, the biggest person they've ever seen. Well, that's culture. true. I can attest to that. <laughs> I bet you if you're going uh, Asia, oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, so uh, so I've I've actually had uh, incidents at uh, public transportation when somebody's touching the, the the small of my back, and when I turn around, we got Asian people taking selfies and, and <laughs> doing this to my back. So so in in some companies, it's just entertaining, uh, and and for, well, fortunately for me, the the language issue uh, very often. Um, uh, does not get me into contact uh, with the actual workforce. Oh, okay. So um, mainly, mainly deal with, yeah, with uh, expats yeah. or people who've been educated in the West. Well, do you have a, a, a favorite case? Everybody's always got a favorite case. 
the, oh, there are the so many. Uh, well, about. my my favorite case is actually um, a very very low threat management case. We we have a client in mainland China that uh, were simply doing conflict resolution skills for their um, uh, uh, frontline staff. And um, I, I was having a meeting before we started. This, this company is based in uh, 64 uh, cities in, in China, all over China. They're a big, big company. Um, um, so I, I was having a meeting with their customer experience director. What's that? Yeah, his title. And I said, well, well, when a customer comes in and wants to complain, uh, what's, what's your policy? And he said, Mr. Totti, we don't have a policy. That's why you're here. I said, well, you, you must have some type of uh, a habit or, or a, a custom that you do. Well, well, if somebody comes in and wants to complain and they're very, very aggressive, we put our most senior female employee to deal with this. And I said, I, I understand most senior, but why female? Well, Mr. Totti, um, if you're very, very angry, you might say bad things to your wife. And if you're extremely angry, you might say bad things to your mother. But you never say bad things to your grandmother. Oh, that's true. That's very so clever. that was their management policy for hostile empl- hostile uh, encounters with clients. <laughs> Have you any, anything that's uh, that went sideways that you weren't expecting? No, you thought you had uh, a handle on it, and you went, "Uh oh." Well, well, most of the cases always have something that you were not expecting, yeah. simply because people are thinking so differently. Yeah. It's like your point, Paul. You just can't. You can't, you we can't, can't predict I mean, things a hundred percent, but we yeah. can get pretty close to it. You know, yeah. Yeah. we're here. Yeah, but is is I mean, your cases over there are they? Are they um, uh, you, you know, I've, uh, uh, at Fox, most of the cases used to go into a, uh, a pretty. You know, you could tell how, how they were going. Pattern. Manageable yeah. sort of pattern, which would which would typically be over a you know quite a quite a length of time. Um, and I've been involved with some cases lately that are real sort of down and dirty and very quick in your face type of thing. I mean, is that where do you see most of your cases going over there? Are they are they are they really intense, or is it you know pretty much you can tell what's going on? Um, uh, very few of the cases are actually extremely tense. They they are more. It's it's question about the local professionals needing more information about how to manage problematic uh, deviant or or violent behavior. Mm. So so um, most of the cases I I feel quite comfortable with the with the management and with the end results. So you do a lot of training. It sounds like too. Advising we and do a lot training. of training. Yeah, you have to create awareness. Yeah, right. Seventy um, percent of our income in, income comes from training. Oh, good. And how many how many countries do you function in over there? Well, at the moment, we got staff in in Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and in Australia. No, no. But, why why Australia? Well, simply because a very very good friend of mine moved to Australia, and, uh, and she works in Perth, so she's quite well connected to. Uh, a big part of uh, Australia, Asia. Australians aren't people I'd want to mess with for some reason. I just get this idea that uh, whether you're the stalker or the victim. Well, they're all ex-criminals. <laughs> I know. It's like, I'm not, not going to read any stalking problems in Australia. They're going to kick your ass if something happens. <laughs> well, it's been a very interesting. I Once again, we learn things on Security Guy Radio. We don't learn other always places. Learn something. I know. I always feel like an idiot yeah. after I finish every yeah. show, which is a great thing to feel, <laughs> actually. So give us your website. Give us how we can get a hold of you. Uh, give us some ideas of, uh, of uh, what you could offer people, and uh, let's, uh, let's take it out. Well, uh, peaceofmind.hk is definitely uh, our, our website to use, or LinkedIn or, or Twitter with, uh, well, my well, let's 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 just keep it to peace of mind. Hk, <laughs> we, we we do we do training, we do consulting, uh, anything related to problematic, deviant, or or violent individuals, and and uh, that's pretty much it. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Tati Capella. That was a good show of peace of mind. Thank you. See, yeah. I know how to pull. That's a very good show. I, I knew this would be yeah. an interesting yeah. show. So once again. Oh, by the way, did you like my shirt? We didn't see my shirt. Yeah, more Driver, Mr. Driver, did you see my little uh, Security Guy Radio shirt? These are available. People want to buy them online. So how much How much are we selling them for? Uh, $75. Oh, right. A little printing That's charges. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, I, I don't know how much. People are asking, but we will sell them if you're interested. In the meantime, get the app for Security Guy Radio. Follow us on SecurityGuyRadio.com. Follow us on SoundCloud, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, the girl site, LinkedIn, 
Google Plus, and Instagram. Look at that. I got it right. Look at that injury. Oh, that's terrible. Sorry. Until next Monday night, thanks for following. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.